Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Pearl and Burning Bright by John Steinbeck. So uh, I have the blurbs here, which I'm going to read out to you. It's actually two in one. Uh, so The Pearl, the poignant story of Kino, the fisherman who found a great pearl. A pearl that was to turn him into every man's enemy. A pearl that was to bring sorrow and death. And then Burning Bright, a powerful human drama of two men. One sterile of body, one sterile of mind. And of a woman, drizman, and of a woman driven to infidelity to keep her husband's love. So we have this very damning thing at the start, and um, Steinbeck's doing this deliberately, you know, to highlight the injustices of racism, essentially. So, uh, yes, the doctor asked. It is a little Indian with a baby. He says a scorpion stung it. The doctor put his cup down gently before he let his anger rise. Have I nothing better to do than cure insect bites for little Indians? I'm a doctor, not a veterinary. And then, of course, he asks if they have any money. Fortunately, the little Indian boy's father finds the pearl. And I like this, uh, this is at the start of part three, this is a description of small towns, which I think is relevant anywhere, you know? A town is a thing like a colonial animal. A town has a nervous system and a head and shoulders and feet. A town is a thing separate from all other towns, so that there are no two towns alike. And a town has a whole emotion. How news travels through a town is a mystery not easily to be solved. News seems to move faster than small boys can scramble and dart to tell it, faster than women can call it over the fences. So I want to read these couple of paragraphs out just because I think they're really beautifully written. And again, it sort of tells you quite a lot about the story. But Kino's hand had closed tightly on the pearl again, and he was glancing about suspiciously, for the evil song was in his ears, shrilling against the music of the pearl. The neighbours slipped away to go to their houses, and Juana squatted by the fire and set her clay pot of boiled beans over the little flame. Kino stepped to the doorway and looked out. As always, he could smell the smoke from many fires, and he could see the hazy stars and feel the damp of the night air so that he covered his nose from it. The thin dog came to him and threshed itself in greeting like a wind-blown flag, and Kino looked down at it and didn't see it. He had broken through the horizons into a cold and lonely outside. He felt alone and unprotected, and scraping crickets and shrilling tree frogs and croaking toads seemed to be carrying the melody of evil. Kino shivered a little and drew his blanket more tightly against his nose. He carried the pearl still in his hand, tightly closed in his palm, and it was warm and smooth against his skin. Behind him he heard Juana packing the cakes before she put them down on the clay cooking sheet. Kino felt all the warmth and security of his family behind him, and the song of the family came from behind him like the purring of a kitten. But now, by saying what his future was going to be like, he had created it. A plan is a real thing, and things projected are experienced. A plan once made and visualized becomes a reality along with other realities, never to be destroyed but easily to be attacked. Thus Kino's future was real, but having set it up, other forces were set up to destroy it, and this he knew, so that he had to prepare to meet the attack. And this Kino knew also, that the gods do not love men's plans, and the gods do not love success unless it comes by accident. He knew that the gods take their revenge on a man if he... They knew that... He knew that the gods take their revenge on a man if he be successful through his own efforts. Consequently, Kino was afraid of plans, but having made one, he could never destroy it. And to meet the attack, Kino was already making a hard skin for himself against the world. His eyes and his mind probed for danger before it appeared. And it's a bloody good job that he was on the lookout for it as well. Not that it particularly helped too much. He used the word burningly, he said his senses were burningly alive, which I personally wasn't much of a fan of. It's like when people say laughingly, God, ugh. Uh, so, in defence of the pearl, he, he kills a man, and we get this paragraph here. He took his knife and left her. He stumbled towards the beach and he came to his canoe. And when the light broke through again, he saw that a great hole had been knocked in the bottom. And a searing rage came to him and gave him strength. Now the darkness was closing in on his family. Now the evil music filled the night, hung over the mangroves, skirled in the wave beat. The canoe of his grandfather plastered over and over, and a splintered hole broken in it. This was an evil beyond thinking. The killing of a man was not so evil as the killing of a boat. For a boat does not have sons, and a boat cannot protect itself, and a wounded boat does not heal. There was sorrow in Kino's rage, but this last thing had tightened him beyond breaking. He was an animal now, for hiding, for attacking, and he lived only to preserve himself and his family. He was not conscious of the pain in his head. He leaped up the beach, through the brush line towards his brush house, and it did not occur to him to take one of the canoes of his neighbours. Never once did the thought enter his head, any more than he could have conceived breaking a boat. So yeah, uh, The Pearl was probably my favourite of the two, but we're going to move on to Burning Bright, a play in story form, uh, which I thought was an interesting concept, and he talks about it in a little introduction here. So he says, Burning Bright is the third attempt I've made to work in this new form, the play novelette. I don't know that anyone else has ever tried it before. Two of my previous books, Of Mice and Men and The Moon is Down, essayed it. In a sense, it is a mistake to call it a new form. Rather, it is a combination of many old forms. It is a play that is easy to read, or a short novel that can be played simply by lifting out the dialogue. Now, I would say, 
that kind of just makes it a novella. Especially, I mean, I wrote a novella that novelised a play. Well, a screenplay, and it did pr pretty much the same thing. But anyway, he does make some good arguments, though. He says, My reasons for wanting to write in this form are several and diverse. I find it difficult to read plays, and in this I do not find myself alone. The printed play is read almost exclusively by people closely associated with the theatre, by students of the theatre, and by the comparatively small group of readers who are passionately fond of the theatre. The first reason for this form, then, is to provide a play that will be more widely read because it is presented as ordinary fiction, which is a more familiar medium. The second reason for the creation of the play novelette is that it augments the play for the actor, the director, and the producer, as well as the reader. The usual description of a character in a play, businessman age 40, gives them very little to go on. It can be argued that with this terse description, the burden of character portrayal must lie in the dialogue and in seeing the actor on stage. It can further be argued that terse description gives the director and the set designer greater leeway in exercising their own imagination in production. Against these arguments, it can be said first that it can do no harm for theatre goers or theatre people to have the fullest sense of the intention of the writer, and second, the director, actor and set designer cannot be limited and may even be helped by a full knowledge of the details pertinent to the action. And for the many people who have not seen the play, and will never see it, this becomes an aid to which they are entitled. Although I still think he just wrote a novella. He describes Joe Saul here and he uses the word spatula, which I really like. His hands were white, the fingers spatula, and palms and fingers callous from the rope and bar. And then I just thought this was sweet, because this is like, you know, lo young love. What's the matter, Joe Saul? Aren't you well? I'm all right. He stood up. Angry then? You must be angry. Your eyes are so black, but when you're angry, they seem to have a red glow. Are you angry with me, Joe Saul? He moved very quickly to her and put his arms around her, and there was hunger and eagerness in his body and in his face. Not angry, he said. No, not angry, and still angry. He stroked her cheek. Angry at time when you were away. Angry at time. Irritated with the minutes when you weren't with me. I like that, she said. It's good to be missed. It is good to be missed. So our friend Ed says this, which is something I don't agree with, but you know, he says, When the bodies of man and women meet in love, there is a promise, sometimes so deep buried in their cells that thinking does not comprehend. There is a sharp promise that a child may be the result of this earthquake and this lightning. This each body promises the other. But if one or the other knows, knows beyond doubt that the promise can't be kept. The wholeness is not there. The thing is an act, a pretense, a lie, and deeply deep a uselessness, a thing of no meeting. I know, she said. Which, like, it just ignores, like, gay sex, for example. How it is with a woman, I'm not sure, he continued. But with a man, perhaps he may feel free because he is in no danger. And perhaps the woman may feel wildly free and lust without consequence. But in her tissues there is a contempt for a sterile man. And in a man there is a searching for the contempt he knows is there. Then, no matter how she pretends and protests and covers the sadness of the sterile love, he knows and feels it. And since we do not willingly do futile things, the man's body gradually refuses to perform a useless act, and the woman, oh, very slowly, has no need for him, and her senses turn away from the dark, double disappointment. I thought this was an interesting quote as well. Uh, they say women and horses know when a man isn't sure of himself. They can tell no matter how much he bluffs. Uh, yeah, those last few bits were from Burning Bright, which I didn't enjoy as much as The Pearl. The Pearl really gave me, like, Old Man in the Sea, Ernest Hemingway vibes, um, except it kind of also looked at the darker sides of human nature as well, which is very cool. Um, overall, I mean, I'd probably give The Pearl a 4 out of 5, Burning Bright a 3.5 out of 5, and give that book as a whole a 3.75 out of 5. It was alright, and I'm glad I read it. I mean, I've been trying to read more Steinbeck recently anyway as well, so, you know, any excuse, but... Not the best of the ones that, of his that I've read, and I've only read about three or so, so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, The Pearl and Burning Bright. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Pearl and Burning Bright by John Steinbeck. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, because they're kind of published separately, really, uh, and what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.